In 350, the Persian Shah, Shapur II, laid siege to the Roman fortress and frontier town of Nisibis. This was the third time that he had directed his army to invest the town, and if one particular source can be believed, Shapur had the surrounding land flooded and attempted to assault the walls with ships. Eventually, however, he pulled back, and he did so in part to deal with a threat which had emerged from the northeast of his kingdom, the Kidarite, or Kidara, Huns. During some time prior to 388, the Kidarites also spread past the Hindu Kush mountains, and that seems to have allowed another group, the Alkan Huns, to enter what is today Pakistan and the surrounding areas. Both invasions are part of what appears to be a movement in Central Asia, of groups of people known collectively as Huns, or Hunna, and who caused very serious problems for both the Sasanian and the Gupta empires, with the Alkan Huns sometimes being blamed as the main cause for the Gupta's demise. The actual evidence we have for these groups is, however, fairly sparse, even as the standards of ancient history go. Oftentimes, we are reliant on Roman, Armenian, or Chinese textual sources dating to the period. In other words, not Persian or Indian sources, or we are reliant on Indian texts which date centuries after the events they describe, and whose veracity has sometimes been called into question. As far as Persian, Indian, and Hunnic sources are concerned, professional historians and archaeologists are reliant upon coins, some artifacts, and a handful of inscriptions in varying states of preservation. Therefore, there are serious gaps in our knowledge, and much of what is known is open to question, or at the very least, competing chronologies. In 2017, the British Museum and the Hermitage conducted a joint exhibit based around cultures of the Eurasian steppe and hosted an academic conference on the subject. Three years later, the presented papers were collectively published, including one by Hans Baker, a scholar of Hinduism and Indology, which surveyed some of the problems in studying these groups and attempted to bring some sort of coherence to all of it. So using that as a jumping off point, this video will briefly take a look at some of those source problems and serve as an introduction for a much longer video on the same topic. In the mid-3rd century, despite the general breakup of the Xiongnu Empire at the hands of the Han Dynasty and other steppe peoples during the preceding century, Chinese sources are clear that they still existed as some sort of political entity in what is today approximately eastern Kazakhstan. To condense a fair amount of research by specialists in Inner Asian Studies and Nomad Studies, the modern Chinese term Xiangnu was, at the time, likely pronounced something like Hongnu, or Hongnu, or Hongnai, and as groups of these people moved westward, due to transliteration into different languages like Greek and Sanskrit, the term is eventually pronounced something like Onai, or Ona, as it's translated from Sanskrit and Sogdian into Greek probably because there were Greek merchants dealing with these people as they moved around the Caspian. In any case, what eventually becomes the term that we know as Hun is likely best understood in these contexts in Central Asia as a political term and not necessarily one that suggests a direct ethnic connection. There does appear to be at least one genetic marker which connects at least some of the original Xiongnu population on the eastern steppe to the later Huns under Attila who invaded the Roman Empire, but the term was often adopted by steppe cultures who wanted to recall the power and dread that that state inspired, or by settled people who use it as a term with similar connotations to barbarian, or for a more accurate translation, enemy or hostile people. All of which leads us to the apparent spread of Hunnic, or Hunna people, out of Central Asia in about the mid-4th century, which roughly corresponds to a general period of drought and climatic and political turmoil on the Central and Eastern Eurasian steppe. In doing so, the Kushan Empire was destroyed, the Sasanian Empire found itself in a subordinate position, and the Gupta Empire eventually met its end. According to the Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus, around 350, the Sasanian Empire came under attack by a group of people he called the Kyanites, or Chianites. Shapur II apparently defeated them, or at least brought them to the table, and he then apparently used these people in an attack on Roman border towns. Chinese sources mention that at this time the Kushan Empire still existed, but we know now that the Kushan Empire was either actually gone by this point, or had broken up into smaller units, specifically one which historians term the Kushano-Sasanian state. 
This may have been either a sub-kingdom or a vassal kingdom, but the rulers still utilized Kushan titles and Kushan imagery, but this seems to have actually disintegrated by 360 or by 365 at the very latest. Essentially, what seems to be happening in these Chinese sources is the conflation of the Kushan Empire, which was referenced in earlier Han Dynasty texts, with some sort of a state that certainly seems to have existed in the region at the time. It would be somewhat similar to a hypothetical situation where, after the end of the Western Roman Empire, Germanic kings utilized Roman titles and, say, an Indian text or some other text far removed from Europe referred to the Roman state still existing, because later rulers employed Roman symbolism and Roman titles. But we would know from European documents that this is not actually the case. So what was this political entity that these Chinese sources discuss? Well, in terms of evidence from Central Asia, we mainly have coins, and those coins reference a king named Kadara. Based on that numismatic evidence and the conflation of different political units referenced in faraway sources, many scholars have argued that the Kayanites mentioned by Ammianus and the Kushans mentioned by Chinese chronicles are a new group of people known collectively as the Kidarites, whom Indian sources refer to as the Hyon, meaning, of course, Huns. Our other textual sources mention kings of Kushan, shahs of Kushan, and Kushans themselves, but the actual coins that these texts correspond to chronologically all show a new type of seal, called a tamga, which are distinct from earlier Kushan tamgas, so what appears to have happened is that a new power of some sort arose in the region of the Kushan kingdom around 350, and that this new power employed the political titles of the Kushan. This new player in the region was the kingdom of the Kidarite Huns. By 388 at the very latest, these Kidarites appear to have crossed the Hindu Kush mountains and established control over Gandhara. We don't have much evidence for this outside of coins, but what we do have appears to suggest that the Kidarites never directly referred to themselves as Huns. That was instead a term used by the Persians, who attempted to drive them from Bactria in a series of wars between about 420 and about 450. In 453, however, the Persian Shah Yazdegerd II was defeated, and the Sasanians apparently found themselves in a tributary position to the Kidarite state. After the Kidarites took control of Gandhara, another group appears to have either displaced them or maybe worked with them to take control first of Gandhara, and then the entire region of Punjab. Our chronology and what we can say about this is confused, because like so much else for this particular time period and region, a lot of the direct evidence is numismatic, with textual sources often coming from farther afield, which of course means that we need to be much more critical with the written evidence, but the coins do at least make it clear that a new group that we know as the Alcon Huns, distinguished on the coins by the practice of cranial deformation, had come into the area. The one thing that can definitely be said is that the balance of power in Gandhara changed as the Kidarites' own power began to wane, and this probably happened because another group showed up. The Hephthalites. We have come to know this particular group of people as the White Huns due to the designation in Indian sources as Sveta Hunna, that is, White Huns, and the same term shows up in Roman sources. There are two theories about who these Hephthalites were that go beyond the appellation of Hun. One is that the Hephthalites were the ruling dynasty of a tribe known as the Hua, whose character may have been pronounced something like Var in early Middle Chinese, and that a better reading of that character is maybe Aguan, which then maybe connects to another word. Aguar, and from that we get Avar, the name of a group of people that migrated to the Pannonian Basin in the mid-6th century. If that is correct in any way, it might make the Hephthalites and at least some of the Avars the same people. The other idea is that the Chinese character should be actually read as Gore, which would then refer to a geographical location in modern Afghanistan, where we know the Hephthalites actually were at about this time. The evidence is not exactly overflowing and questions like this may never really be solved, but what can be said is that they seem to have defeated the Kidarites and have then taken over much of the territory in Bactria. The Persian Shah Peraz was defeated by them and captured, and he then had to be ransomed by the Roman Emperor Zeno. Afterwards, he was defeated again in 484, and the Sasanian Empire entered into a tributary status with the Hephthalites just as they had been with the Kidarites in 453. For several decades after this point, the Persian Shahs essentially relied on Hephthalite support for their rule. This seems to be the context in which the Alcon Huns established control in Gandhara. This group is also known as the Red Huns, so how do we explain these colors? There was one idea that they were perhaps labeled as Red Huns because that was the color of their armor and their flags, 
but work conducted by linguists and philologists has allowed a new idea to emerge. The Xiongnu, or at least a portion of them, migrated to the Altai region after the breakup of their empire in the first century. With that said, everything else that will be covered in this section of the video is, and I cannot stress this enough, tentative and still open to debate among professionals. Archaeologically, the Xiongnu appear to have emerged out of an earlier culture in Mongolia that we call the Slab Grave Culture. Genetically, the Slab Grave Culture appears to be connected to the Xiongnu as well. The Huns who eventually emerged out of the Xiongnu as they migrated westward entered Europe speaking a language that appears to be a form of Turkic. The original homeland of the Turkic languages is not entirely certain. The oldest written form we have of it, the famous Orkhon inscriptions, come from the Orkhon Valley in Mongolia, but many Turkologists and linguists would place the original homeland of the Turkic languages somewhere in eastern Central Asia, probably around the Altai Mountains. It's not entirely certain, but in other words, it's probably not near the origin point of the Xiongnu. The language that that people spoke is not confirmed, but a Yanisian language is usually postulated, although there are other scholars that would argue for some form of an Iranian language, or maybe a language isolate, or maybe some early form of a language which eventually becomes Mongolian. However, some form of Turkic was probably the lingua franca of the empire, and by the time period under discussion in this video, roughly the 4th and 5th centuries, the Xiongnu in Central Asia seemed to have undergone a language flip where Turkic became the dominant tongue. This matters because the term Alkan is possibly linked with a Turkic word for red, Al, so Al and Hun would result in Alkan, Red Huns. It was not uncommon for historical steppe peoples to assign colors to the four directions and to then assign values to those directions and colors. Oftentimes, the color black signified north and blue signified east, both of which often ranked higher than white, which signified west, and red, which signified south. This is probably where the terms white and red Huns come from, and the apparent prevalence of terms referring to black among the famous Huns of Attila seems to back this up, but none of this is completely solid. If a group of black or blue Huns ever existed, historians have not found a trace of them in the textual record. In any case, the Heptalites certainly claim to be Huns because that's what was written on their coins, and they appear to have placed pressure on the Kidarites as that group was displaced southeastwards towards India. In the second half of the 5th century, the Alkan Huns united Gandhara and the Punjab, quite possibly arising out of the Kidarites as they moved into the area, or possibly being connected to the Heptalites, and they established a confederation with four kings. Whatever the connection, or perhaps lack thereof, the Alkans and the Heptalites were allies, and through that alliance they had access to the Eurasian steppe. To the south, the Gupta Empire was tottering, and with steady access to the steppe and the horses and supplies that came with it, the Alkan Confederacy became a force to be reckoned with. Unlike the Kidarites, however, we have a little more evidence to work with here, in the form of the Swat Bowl and the Soyan Copper Scroll. The Swat Bowl was discovered in 1912 in Gandhara, and it's crafted from silver, with the actual dating of the artifact ranging somewhere between probably about 460 and probably about 479 or 480. It depicts four hunters, and numismaticists have determined that the art style and the figures depicted roughly match Alcon coins, notably because the bowl seems to show at least one hunter with an elongated skull, a custom that the Alcon hunter known to have practiced. What this is probably showing is two Alcons and two Kidarites perhaps the four kings of the Alcon Confederacy, so in other words, two different groups of people living in a state of coexistence. There is an inscription on the bowl, however, which appears to have been added after it was initially created, and it's not entirely clear what that writing says. It may be the name of a ruler, or it may be a date, or it may refer to the weight of the bowl. Which of those three interpretations are correct, if any, is not certain, and a detailed analysis of the artifact is badly needed but at the very least, it further backs up Hunnic presence in the area. The Shoyan Copper Scroll was actually authorized by the Alcon Huns, and it makes reference to the four Alcon kings, further reinforcing our understanding of the political situation of the Alcons. It probably dates to the year 495, or maybe 496, and the titles used in the document to refer to the Alcon kings lists them using Sanskrit terms which denote a hierarchical system, and we know from a slightly later inscription that the second most powerful of those four kings, Toromana, became sole ruler, effectively destroying the previous system. 
So then at some point between the date of the SWAT bolt, between about 460 and about 480, and about 495 or 496 with the creation of the Shoy and Copper Scroll, the entire system began to be upended, and the Alcon probably came under the rule of one individual. The scroll itself is not actually concerned with the kings of the Alcon Huns, but rather with the erection of a Buddhist stupa. And based on place names in the document, it's probable that by this time, Alcon control reached Kashmir. Perhaps more interesting than the actual extent of geographic control is the fact that the scroll gives a short rundown of ties of vassalage and other functions of government. While there were four Hunnic kings at the top, at least prior to Toramana's apparent seizure of power, working under them were officials and aristocrats who appeared to have been drawn from the wider Kushan world. In the aftermath of Peraz's defeat at the hands of the Hephthalites in 484, the Alkans appear to have taken advantage of regional instability in Persia and India, and conquered more territory to the south. By 498, Toramana was in sole control, and he designated himself emperor as far south as Iran and Kosambi. The situation, however, was not to last. Reinvigorated by Kusra, the new Persian Shah, and in alliance with a new power on the steppe, the Gok Turks, the Persians finally defeated the Hephthalites once and for all. With their ally gone and thus their access to the Eurasian steppe more or less removed, the fortunes of the Alkan Huns gradually fell into decline. In the aftermath of the Gupta Empire's disintegration, the Malkari dynasty sprang up, one of a number of post-Gupta states. Fielding an army of cavalry and infantry, and utilizing war elephants as shock troops, the Huns were driven from India, and they gradually faded into the mist of time.